Okay, today we are in First Chronicles. We are in First Chronicles chapter 23, beginning in verse 1. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, When David was old and full of years, he made his son Solomon king over Israel. David anointed Solomon as king before he died, and that was a bit unusual. Normally the successor wasn't anointed until after the reigning king died, but David wanted to make sure that God's chosen one, Solomon, was on the throne. Verse 2, he also gathered together all the leaders of Israel, as well as the priests and Levites. The Levites, thirty years old or more, were counted, and the total number of men was 38,000. The Levites were the tribe in Israel that the priest came from. You've heard of the Levitical priesthood, perhaps. That's what it's about. And um, they could not serve as a priest until they reached the age of 30. It says in verse 4, David said, Of these 24,000 are to supervise the work of the temple of the Lord, and 6,000 are to be officials and judges. 4,000 are to be gatekeepers, and 4,000 are to praise the Lord with the musical instruments I have provided for that purpose. The gatekeepers opened and shut the doors and also kept order in the temple. And then verses 6 through 27 just list the men from the tribe of Levi. We'll just skip down to verse 28. It says the duty of the Levites was to help Aaron's descendants in the service of the temple of the Lord, to be in charge of the courtyards, the side rooms, the purification of all sacred things, and the performance of other duties at the house of God. And the cooking, the baking, the chopping of wood for the sacrifices, whatever needed to be done, whatever physical labor needed to be done in the temple um, for the worshipers and for the priests, was performed by the young Levites. And so they all had their form of ministry. And it says in verse 30, it says, they were, yeah, verse 30, sorry, they were also to stand every morning to thank and praise God. They were to do the same in the evening. So the Levites also were to lead the praise and, praise and worship services that went on at the temple as well. Verse 31, And whenever burnt offerings were presented to the Lord on the Sabbaths and the new moon festivals and at appointed feasts, and says they were to serve before the Lord regularly in the proper number and in the way prescribed for them. And so the high priest and the other priests were the spiritual leaders in Israel. The other Levites helped prepare the sacrifices and did the manual labor which needed to be done around the temple and in connection with any of the temple services and ministries. 32. And so the Levites carried out their responsibilities for the tent of meeting for the holy place and under their brothers and descendants of Aaron for the service of the temple of the Lord. And there were many opportunities to serve God in the temple just as there are many opportunities to serve God in the church today. And not everyone is called to pastor or teach, just like not everyone was called to be a priest back in the Old Testament days. But everyone has an opportunity to do something, to help support that ministry in some fashion, according to the gifts that God has given them. And so no matter how simple a job is, if it's done for the Lord, it is ministry and he will reward it, and he will be pleased with it. And now we're going to skip several chapters. Chapter 24 lists the divisions of the priest. We won't get into that. Chapter 25 lists the singers. Chapter 26 lists the gatekeepers and other officials. Chapter 27 lists the army's divisions and the officers from the different tribes in Israel. So let's skip down through all those names and things like that. Let's go right down to chapter 28. 
chapter 28. We'll look at this chapter yet in this message, and then next time we'll finish up in chapter 29. So, chapter 28, verse 1, David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem, the officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions in the service of the king, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the mighty men, and all the brave warriors. And so this is David's last big assembly. And it's about the temple project. And he calls all these people from all over Israel together. And it says in verse 2, King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and I made plans to build it. David, out of respect for God, wanted to build a permanent home for the ark. The ark, of course, the ark of the covenant was a gold-plated box, a holy box, gold-plated except for the lid, which was solid gold. It was God's throne here on earth, and, you know, David wanted to build a permanent place for it because it had dwelt in a tent for so many years. And he thought if anyone should have a permanent home, it ought to be God. And then it says in verse 3, David says, But God said to me, You are not to build a house for my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. Well, David was, in a sense, disqualified because he fought in so many wars. And those wars were against the unrighteous nations which surrounded Israel and they had to be fought and yet perhaps it just wasn't fitting for a man of war even just war to build a holy temple verse 4 yet the Lord the God of Israel chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever he chose Judah as leader and from the house of Judah he chose my family, and from my father's sons he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. And I don't think David ever got over the fact that God chose him, the youngest son out of seven, to be the king of his people. He was just a little lowly shepherd boy when God chose him, and um, could not believe that the Lord would ask him to do this very important job. Verse 5. Of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And then in verse 6 it says, He said to me, Solomon your son is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. He wants all the leaders in Israel to understand that Solomon is God's choice to lead Israel. David wants David wants them all to understand. All these leader, leaders gathered, they want him to, he wants them to understand that Solomon is God's choice, and he wants them to support him for that reason. Seven. I will establish his kingdom forever, if he is unswerving and carrying out my commands and laws as it is being done at this time. And so there is a promise. It's not an unconditional promise from God to Solomon, but it is a promise, a promise of support. However, God did not promise to stand by Solomon and bless him if he decided to rebel against the Lord, which unfortunately he did later on in his reign. Verse, verse 8, So now I charge you in the sight of all Israel and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. God was at that meeting, and David was his spokesman. And the people there needed to obey God. The nation needed to obey God, or their nation would experience trouble instead of good times. Verse 9, And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father, and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. 
but if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Nothing has changed. God doesn't want an outward, cold, religious show from us either. He wants us to be devoted to him from our heart. And something else that hasn't changed, if one forsakes God, that is, if you turn away from him, then he will reject you. And so it's up to Solomon, and it's up to us. Verse 10, Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a temple as a sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Solomon was chosen by God for this project. But Solomon must choose to do the work. God chooses us for eternal life, but we must work out our own salvation according to Philippians. Solomon can f- refuse, and so can we, because God has given us a free will. Verse 11, <clears throat> it says, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico of the temple, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and the place of atonement. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms, for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries for the dedicated things. God gave the plans to David, who then passed them on to Solomon. And like with the tabernacle, everything had to be done according to God's plans. This was his home. This was the place of worship. The worship had to be carried out exactly how God wanted it to be done. And he gave the plan ahead of time. You know, sometimes people think that today, they think that if something isn't totally spontaneous in church, then it's not led by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's an unbiblical, that's an unbiblical way to think. That's not true. God, more often than not, in Scripture, worked through carefully, carefully thought out plans. Verse 13. He gave him instructions for the division of the priests and Levites, and for all the work of serving in the temple of the Lord, as well as for all the articles to be used in its service. Evidently, things had not been operating according to the plan that God had given Moses concerning the priesthood and their sacrifices. They had gotten away from it, and as a result, God lays it all out before Solomon again. And so the worship of God needs to be done the right way in order to be acceptable by God. And then verses 14 through 18 just gives us some details concerning the temple furniture and uh, utensils and stuff like that. So let's skip down to verse 19. All this, David said, I have in writing from the hand of the Lord upon me. And he gave me understanding and all the details of the plan. And so the details of the holy temple were as inspired as the Holy Scriptures themselves. They both came from God. And one was oral, one was written, but they're both the word of the Lord. Verse 20. David also said to Solomon his son, Be strong and courageous, and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. And David was reminding Solomon that God would not have called him to do this job without equipping him to finish it. God doesn't call his children to do something unless he gives them the ability to do it. And the Bible says, my grace is sufficient for you. Solomon is just a young fellow. He needs encouragement. He needs to understand that truth. Verse 21. The divisions of the priests and Levites are ready for all the work on the temple of God, and every willing man skilled in any craft will help you in all the work. The officials and all the people will obey your every command. David had everything set. He even assigned jobs to the workers. It was all in place. All Solomon had to do was supervise the project. And and he had people under him who were supervisors too. big difference between David and Solomon. David had it rough. I mean, he worked himself up through the ranks as a shepherd boy, as somebody who ministered to the previous king, as a soldier, as a general, 
a war hero. He really did work himself up through the ranks. He went through the school of hard knocks, which is why he was so experienced. Solomon, on the other hand, you know, he had everything handed to him, growing up in the palace and everything. And so, you know, David keeps saying, be strong, be brave. And I suppose that's what, that's what, something, that's something like that comes from experience. You don't learn, you don't learn bravery in a book. You learn it by experience. And Solomon lacked experience. But we will see when we get into his life a little bit deeper that at first anyway, he looked to God for strength. Next time, chapter 29. Until then, so long everyone.